Um, our agenda for today, we're going to be talking about handling human exposures, including reporting and testing, um, state rabies laws, including vaccination and quarantine protocols, also handling animal exposures, including boosters and other protocols, and then we'll finally we'll address some scenarios and situations that you may encounter as well. So um, now we're going to get started, and we're going to start with some basics with Dr. Jennifer Brown from the State Health Department. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Denise. Um, thanks to all of you for um, taking time out of your day to attend this presentation. I hope it will be useful to you. So I want to begin by thanking all of you for the work that you do at your local agencies, because without your work at the local level, rabies would not be as rare as it is in the United States today. Um, these black and white photos are from CDC's archives, and um, they represent a time in the 1950s when human rabies cases were not uncommon. Um, and, um, you know, talking to my folks who grew up in the 50s, and um, if you or or your folks grew up in the 1950s, chances are either they got rabies trophy when they were a kid or they know someone who did um, because rabies was much more common. It's, it's through our combined efforts um, on the human health side and the animal health side, um, public health nurses, environmental health specialists, animal control officers, and other law enforcement officers um, that the actions can be taken to keep rabies rare in the United States. So thank you all for the essential role that you play in human rabies prevention. Just to go over a few um, background facts um, for review, and, and the, the background of this disease, the, um, the pathology of this disease is the basis for all of our um, regulations. So if you can um, keep in mind the transmission cycle, how the disease is transmitted, um, it really does help to make sense of some of our regulations and quarantines and things like that. So the way that rabies is transmitted is in the saliva through the bite of an infected animal. And for our purposes, a bite is any penetration of the skin by an animal's tooth. It does not need to be a severe bite, a deep bite, a mauling. Um, the, the bite does not need to cause severe injury to be capable of, um, of transmitting rabies. The way that the virus is transmitted is it's shed in the saliva, and when an infected animal bites a person or another animal, the virus is inoculated under the surface of the skin, it multiplies, and then enters into the nerves. First, the peripheral nervous system, um, maybe in one of the extremities, as you can see in this picture, and then it works its way up through the peripheral nerves to the spinal cord, the central nervous system, and then works its way up the spinal cord until it gets to the brain. And it's in the brain where rabies causes a very severe, acute, rapidly progressive, and almost invariably fatal encephalitis. Um, because of the disruption of nerve activity from, from the presence of virus in the brain. Once the virus reaches the brain, it eventually works its way down to the salivary glands. And of course, that is when the person or the animal is capable of transmitting the virus to others through exposure to infectious saliva. So this process takes a while. Um, the incubation period for rabies is dependent on the, the speed at which the virus moves from the site of the bite up to the brain and the salivary glands. And that um, typically in an infected person can take about three to 12 weeks, sometimes even longer than that. Rabies is maintained in the United States in wild animal reservoir hosts. And the four species that are of highest risk in the United States are bats, skunks, raccoons, and foxes. These are the four species that we would consider to be um, greatest risk uh, for transmission of rabies when a human bite occurs. Um, you'll notice in Indiana, um, we don't have um, any areas colored in. That's because we don't currently have skunks, raccoons, or foxes um, actively circulating the virus in our state. We do have the virus present in bats. Bat rabies is present throughout the United States. However, we do still consider skunks, raccoons, and foxes to be high-risk species because of the possibility of um, local spread of the virus back into the borders of our state, and also because of the possibility of translocation of animals across state lines. And this is something that definitely does occur. Small prey animals like rabbits and hares, rodents, or pocket pets um, don't tend to carry rabies in the wild. And so we would consider these species be little to no risk for rabies transmission, things like chipmunks, 
squirrels, rats, and mice. We usually don't even test these guys for rabies, and we don't usually recommend rabies prophy um, if a person's bitten by one of these species. But um, that being said, if you hear of a very unusual situation where an animal is uh, acting extremely abnormally or in a bizarre fashion or is having some possibly neurologic type symptoms and bites a person, we would consider testing in that scenario. This is a chart showing you the most recent animal rabies case um, by species in Indiana um, over the last several decades. 2019 is the red line all the way to the right to show you where we are right now. Um, we had a rabid bat as recently as 2018. We will most definitely have have another one this year. We have rabbit bats every year in Indiana, as I'll show you here in a little bit. I want to point out a couple things on this chart. Um, if you find the cat and the dog, um, the last time we had a rabid cat or a rabid dog in the state of Indiana was in the 1980s. So um, we are starting with a low prior probability that any given dog or cat in the state of Indiana is carrying the virus, even if it's a stray. Now, that doesn't mean that that couldn't happen today. It, there's always a possibility present that a dog or cat could acquire rabies virus from contact with a bat in our state, um, but that has not happened over the last several decades. And so you know, we would, in general, consider dogs and cats to be low-risk low species, but we would always recommend that dog and cat bites be taken seriously and thoroughly evaluated, um, even despite that, that low prior probability of infection. Uh, the last time we had a rabid skunk was in 2004. Um, we, we have had skunk variant rabies circulating in South Central Indiana um, as recently as the early 2000s. And then um, the last two human rabies cases were in 2006 and 2009. And we know from laboratory testing that both of those rabies cases were the result of exposure to bats. Our baseline for bat rabies in Indiana tends to be between about 10 and 20 cases per year. Um, you see, we had, did have a few years there in the late 2000s where we had higher than normal reported numbers of bat rabies cases, um, but we've now returned back down to what I would consider to be our baseline, um, 10 to 20 cases per year and typically spread throughout the state. And let's see if the next yeah, I thought I had a map in here, but I don't. Um, the, the, um, the occurrence of bat rabies um, is, is present throughout the state of Indiana. Sometimes I'll get phone calls asking, well, have you seen any bat rabies around here recently? Because I've got a resident that might have been exposed to a bat, so I want to know um, if there's any bat rabies around here. That's actually not the way I would encourage you to think about it. I would encourage you to think about bat rabies being present throughout the state from north to south, from east to west, any bat exposure should be considered a possible rabies exposure and should be evaluated accordingly. Another thing to know about, about bat bites is that um, the, they can inflict very limited injury. So we have multiple bat species present in Indiana, by far the most commonly submitted one to our lab and the most common one to come up positive for rabies is the big brown bat, which is shown here. And hopefully you can see in this picture, um, these are um, insectivorous bats. They eat bugs, and so they have teeny tiny little needle sharp teeth to, to grab those bugs and um, chomp up their, their exoskeletons. And those tiny little teeth don't inflict very, very much injury um, when a bite is inflicted upon a person. So this picture on the left hand side of the slide is a person who was bitten by this species of bat earlier in the day where that picture was taken. And you can see, you know, if you didn't know that something was there, you would probably hardly notice it. And this is why I usually tell physicians not to rely on physical examination findings to rule out the possibility that a bat bite occurred. And of course, on an animal, um, on skin that's covered with hair, it would be impossible to notice a bite like that. So I want to talk a little bit about handling human exposures. Um, and just go over a couple of key points, um, most of which were taken from our, um, our state regulations, our communicable disease rule, which um, governs the reporting of, of, of many different um, health conditions, um, of which animal bites are one. So animal bites, in our, according to our regulations, are report, reportable to the local health department. Um, and this comes from this section of our communicable disease rule, if you care to look it up. It says every case of a human bitten by a domestic or wild mammal shall be reported within 24 hours to the local health officer having jurisdiction 
and the reported bite shall be investigated immediately by the local health officer. This is referring to the local health officer with jurisdiction over the county of residence of the patient. And um, that makes things a little complicated as we'll discuss here in a moment. Um, a rabies risk assessment should be completed for all animal bites. So every, um, every occurrence of a person bitten by a mammal um, should have some sort of evaluation. And I know that at the local level, your procedures and policies and your priorities and your capacity is gonna be different from county to county. Uh, but this is the, this is the ideal. ideal any, ideally, anyone who's reported with an animal bite should have a rabies risk assessment completed. And the purpose of that rabies risk assessment and that investigation is to determine whether the bite victim needs to get rabies post-exposed prophylaxis. Um, there's a couple of pieces of information that can be collected to help make that decision. Um, first is if the biting animal is a dog, cat, or ferret. Um, we can impose a 10-day quarantine period on the animal, um, and if the animal passes the quarantine, then we know that it was not capable of transmitting rabies at the time that the bite occurred. Um, if a quarantine is not possible for a biting dog, cat, or ferret, or if a, a person is bitten by another animal, a wild animal, then we would want to test the animal for rabies if it's available. Um, doing these two things when possible um, gives us solid evidence to make decisions about whether someone needs post prophylaxis. So to touch on this point again, the local health department in the county of residence of the bite victim is ultimately responsible for ensuring the health of their resident by making sure that a rabies risk assessment is completed. But as you all know, out in the field, um, this can get a little complicated because um, local health departments divide up their work by the county of residence the patient where local animal control agencies divide up their work by the county where a bite incident occurred. And in some of these situations, we have three jurisdictions involved, right? Because you could have a person bitten in one county, um, but they live in a different county, and then the dog or cat um, might live in a third county. And so, you know, we, we know that um, the local health department may choose delegate some tasks associated with um, evaluation of the, um, of the bite victim to other county agencies like animal control, for example. Um, but the other, the other thing here is that actions by other jurisdictions may be necessary if the bite occurred in a different county or if the animal lives in a different county or both. Um, and this means that um, you may need to get on the phone with an agency um, in, a, in a county outside of your own county. Um, you know, for animal control agencies, this might mean that you would, you would be asked to quarantine an animal that resides in your county, even if it bit someone from outside the county. And um, we, we, encourage you, we encourage you to do that because you, in that situation, your agency is really the only agency with jurisdiction to do that action. Um, you're not going it, to, it's not possible for someone from outside your county to come in and quarantine an animal that lives in your county. And, you know, I think that um, you'll find that these things will even out in the end. You know, the next time something comes up, it may be someone who lives in your county, but then the dog lives in a different county. And so that animal control agency then can return the favor by, um, by implementing the quarantine in that case. Um, another thing that, um, that's come up that we wanted to talk about was um, encouraging you all to establish procedures to facilitate animal rabies testing. So um, when, a, when it's a dog, cat, or ferret, if it's not possible to complete a 10-day quarantine and the animal needs to be tested, um, how, will you, how will you assist your resident um, by, um, by helping to facilitate that testing? If someone um, is bitten by a bat that they found in their house and they've caught a live bat and that animal needs to be tested, how will you help them facilitate that testing? Or if they're bitten by a live raccoon that they've gotten a trap in their backyard, these are all things that, that come up actually pretty regularly. Um, so this, this may include um, euthanasia, decapitation, and transport or shipping of specimens to ISDH. So we'll talk here in a little bit about indications for rabies testing, um, but I'd ask you at this point to just think to yourself, you know, if, if I had a resident call me up and say they had a live raccoon in a trap and it had bitten their kid, um, what would I do? Would I have a way to get that raccoon euthanized 
decapitated and shipped to the state lab for rabies testing. And if you don't know how you would accomplish that, or if your agency doesn't have an existing policy for that, um, this would be a great time to try to establish those policies um, and talk with your other local agencies to work out some procedures for that so that you're not left scrambling um, when that situation comes up. Reporting advice, a couple different ways that we can do that. The first is state form uh, 14072. Um, good, old, good old state form 14072, I think, was last updated in, oh my gosh, I don't know, 1994 maybe, <laughs> or 2004. Um, so, uh, but it still does a great job of collecting all the information that we need. It's available on our website. Um, another option for you, um, if you are um, at the at a local animal control agency and we're um, formerly using our electronic disease surveillance system to report bites, um, that was called INEDS. We've upgraded our system to a new system called NDS, and um, you should still have access to that system to report electronically in the same way you were doing previously. And if you need more information about that, um, then you can contact me and I can, um, I can help you out. So when we're doing our um, rabies risk assessments, um, this is the general procedure um, that we would want to take place or the, the thought process um, that we would want to engage in when, um, when reviewing these animal bite incidents. Um, the first question we would ask is, did sufficient contact occur to allow transmission of rabies virus? And there's a few different types of contact. There's bite exposure, which as we said earlier, is penetration of the skin by an animal's tooth. Um, a non-bite exposure um, could be introduction of infectious saliva into um, mucous membranes, eyes, nose, or mouth, or into an open wound. Um, either of these types of exposures could potentially result in um, transmission of rabies virus. And then um, there's a few special situations with bats. If a bat is found in the same room with someone who is deeply asleep, or with an unintended child, or with a person whose cognitive abilities are impaired in some way, um, then we would probably consider that to be an exposure as well, um, due to the fact that um, bat bites can inflict very limited injury, and there's not a great way to rule out the possibility of exposure to a bat in those situations. If we determine that sufficient contact did occur, the next question becomes, okay, well, was the animal rabid? Um, if the biting animal is a rabies vector, uh, a dog, cat, ferret, bat, skunk, raccoon, fox, or other wild carnivore. And if the animal is available, then we would always recommend um, quarantine or rabies testing, um, depending on the situation. Um, even if the animal is current on rabies vaccination, and even if there's uh, the situation would suggest a low probability of rabies transmission. Um, if a bite has occurred and the animal is a species that can transmit rabies and the animal is available, we do always want to verify its rabies status so that we have evidence to, um, to make our decision about post-exposure prophylaxis for that patient. And so here's the, the techniques that are appropriate in these situations. Um, for dogs, cats, and ferrets, um, we, would, we would strongly prefer to complete the 10-day quarantine if the animal is alive and healthy. Um, you know, we only have one microbiologist at our state lab who can do rabies testing, and so um, we, we just don't have the capacity at, at our lab to test every dog, cat, or ferret that bites um, if it's possible to do the 10-day quarantine instead. So the 10-day quarantine is required if, the, if, a, if it's a dog, cat, or ferret, and if the animal is alive and healthy at the time of the bite. Um, if it's not possible to complete a 10-day quarantine, for example, if, for example, if the animal has died, um, or if the animal is so sick that it wouldn't be humane to try to keep the animal alive for 10 days, then we can go ahead and submit those animals to our lab for rabies testing. For wild animals, the 10-day quarantine is not an acceptable option. That's not been um, validated as a method to establish whether that, that animal could have transmitted rabies at the time that a bite occurred. The only acceptable method to assess the rabies status of a biting wild animal species um, is to um, euthanize, decapitate the animal, and submit it to our lab for rabies testing. So again, just to review, um, indications for rabies testing, we'd always want to test rabies reservoir species like bats, skunks, foxes, and raccoons. Other wild carnivores, like coyotes, for example, would be good candidates for testing. 
We'd want to test dogs, cats, and ferrets if a 10-day quarantine cannot be completed. And we want to test any mammal that's exhibiting neurologic symptoms at the time uh, that a bite has occurred. Just a few points on laboratory testing. Uh, please do not submit live animals to our lab. Um, it's not safe for our microbiologist. Uh, we would much rather have the euthanasia happen in a safe environment um, at an animal control agency or shelter or at a veterinarian's office. Um, bats may be submitted intact. Uh, you can just submit the whole bat. But for any other animal species, we can only accept the head. Um, for large animals like horses or cattle, um, it might be better to get a sample of brain tissue. So if you have that situation come up in your county, we can um, help you troubleshoot. Um, and usually what we'd recommend in that situation is send them up to Purdue to collect the specimen, and then they'll send a, a piece of brain tissue down to our lab. Specimens should be shipped on, on cold packs. They should be shipped using overnight delivery. Please do not send them UPS ground. We have had counties do that before, and UPS ground doesn't always get to Indy overnight. Um, if it takes longer than one day, um, it can really compromise the integrity of the specimen. Um, so if, if you need to wait, um, you can refrigerate specimens for up to 72 hours. Freezing doesn't mess up the testing, but it does delay the results because we have to let the, the specimen thaw out because before it can be tested. And then please, please, please ship for overnight delivery during normal business hours. We cannot accept deliveries on Saturdays or Sundays. Um, to submit, you're going to need to fill out um, a requisition form, and you can fill out a paper form, which is shown here on the left. But as Actually, a lot better for you guys as local agencies if you get a LymphNet account, if you don't have one already, because uh, this will allow you to log in and see the results immediately um, as soon as they're available uh, without having to call us and uh, without having to um, or without having to wait for a phone call. Uh, for you animal control officers out there, this might be something you, you could consider. Um, there is a way to euthanize bats without having to do a lot of handling um, rather than you injecting euthanasia solution, you can actually use um, a saturated cotton ball with isoflurane, a veterinary anesthetic, and then put it in an airtight container with the bat. Uh, the bat will be euthanized uh, pretty effectively using that technique, and you won't have to do a lot of handling, which is great because uh, bats are a high-risk species for, for rabies. So we've basically been over this. Essentially, um, a person bitten by a dog, cat, or ferret, um, the, the animal must be quarantined if it's alive or healthy. Um, if it passes the quarantine, we know the person doesn't need rabies prophy, and typically we recommend that the person wait to, um, to get rabies prophy until um, those results of the quarantine are available. If the animal um, is dead or dies or becomes ill with neurologic symptoms during the quarantine, we'd recommend euthanasia, rabies testing at our lab. Um, it's regardless of the rabies vaccination status of the animal, and then we would make the recommendations for rabies prophy depending on those results. Um, so sorry, to back up a little bit, for situations where the animal is not available, your risk assessment is going to depend on the circumstances of the bite. And um, I can provide more information about that um, after the call. I, probably what I'll do is send some, is, is there a way to reach all of the people by email who are participating? Okay, yeah, there's a slide I should have included that talks about how to decide if a, um, if a situation is high risk if the animal is not available. I'll make sure you guys get that after the call. And then for you public health nurses out there, I think this is my last slide. Um, this is just a um, review of appropriate rabies post exposure prophylaxis for unvaccinated. Um, Previously unvaccinated people who have competent immune systems, they're going to get four doses of rabies vaccine with a dose of immune globulin on the first day. A person who is immune compromised is going to get five doses of rabies vaccine with immune globulin on the first day. But a previously vaccinated person does not get immune globulin and they only need two doses of vaccine. So, um, and you can call at any time for consultation on animal bite calls. Um, this is a, our main number for the Indiana State Department of Health. You'll um, get an automatic menu if you call after hours, and you can press one to speak with the epidemiologist on call. So now we'll turn it over to Dr. Sandy Norman to talk about um, rabies prevention in animals. My name is Dr. Sandy Norman. I'm from the United States Board of M Health, and we're going to talk about the different vaccination and quarantine laws that we have in the state of Indiana regarding animals. Um, the law requiring vaccination of all dogs, cats, and ferrets rests with the Board of Animal Health and another jurisdiction, state veterinarian. 
State veterinarian determines the vaccination status of animals in bite situations. And we use the National Association of State Public Health Compendium on Rabies, Animal Rabies Prevention and Control in our determinations. And that's a document that's formulated by a committee on a periodic basis and is updated um, uh, either, they meet every year, but is updated uh, periodically to reflect the latest scientific evidence re regarding rabies. For example, ferrets used to not be able to vaccinate rabies they, they have, and that's a result of the work by the Compendium Committee. So just so you understand, I frequently get questions from animal control officers and, and officials in local jurisdictions about where the code is for the rabies program. There's two different kinds of laws. There's Indiana code, that's what's passed by the legislature, and there's administrative code, and those are the rules written in order to administer the code. So uh, the rabies vaccination law is not in code. The legislators do not make the determination for rabies vaccination. They've charged that to the Board of Animal Health and the state veterinarian. So um, frequently I'm asked, this says by prosecutors where it is in code. So under the powers and duties of the Board of Animal Health in section 13, we have a power and it's number 19, there's 34 powers. And one of them is to investigate, develop, and implement the best methods for prevention, detection, control, suppression, or eradication of diseases and pests of animals. So this is the power that the board uses, for example, to control tuberculosis in livestock or brucellosis in other livestock, classical swine fever in pigs, equine infectious anemia in horses, and in this case, rabies in, um, in, pet, in dogs, cats, and ferrets to protect the general public. So I just want you to understand that while it's not in code, which is what prosecutors use in many cases, it is in code that we have the power to do this. This led to the writing of Administrative Code 345, that's Administrative Code for the NSA Board of Animal Health, and that's what's on the next slide which says 245 IOC 1-5-1, and this is all available on the internet, all dogs, cats, and ferrets three months of age and older need to be currently vaccinated for rabies vaccine. Uh, we use three months because that's what's on the label. Three months is what has, is put on the label by the USDA. It's approved and it's all rabies vaccine. There's a one-year product, and remember that ferrets and livestock classically only have a one-year duration product, and there's a one and a three-year product approved for dogs and cats. Uh, we go by the approved label. The first rabies vaccine, whether it's given at three months or it's the first rabies vaccine given to an adult dog or cat is only good for one year, whether you use it the one or three-year vaccine. The very first rabies vaccine is, is only good for one year. I wanna repeat that. When the three-year vaccine is given the second time, it is then good for three years. People can opt or veterinarians can opt to give just the annual vaccine and it's just good for one year and that's what's on the label. But if they give a one or three year vaccine and then the next year they can give a three year product and then the three year interval is, is what is given on subsequent boosters. The one year vaccine can be given every year or the dog cat can be given an initial rabies vaccine and one year later be given three year vaccine. A booster will then be required every three years. Vaccination in the state of Indiana must be given by or under the direct supervision of a licensed accredited veterinarian. And that means licensed accredited veterinarian has to be on the premises. Uh, next slide. So under our vaccination law, we do not allow waivers or exemptions. They are not permitted. And that would be like medical exemptions or waivers because the animal's too old. I hear a variety of reasons. We do not allow waivers in the state of Indiana. There are, uh, Titers are not, are not recommended by the compendium I referred to from the National Association of Public Health Veterinarians as a substitute for vaccines. Um, there are some states, a few dozen states, who do allow medical exemptions, but we do not in Indiana. Titers are not recommended by the NAS PHV compendium, and titers are only used to allow travel to other countries with currently vaccinated animals. Now, what do we do in the case? Owners can refuse their vaccination, the state does not enforce this door to door. We don't have the ability to enforce it in over 3 million animals. Pets are considered unvaccinated. If the owners refuse the vaccination, we tell the veterinarians to document that. We can't uh, make them. He can inform them of the law needs to be done. When the pet bites somebody or bites other animals, the pets are considered an unvaccinated and they, have, they will be handled as an unvaccinated in the exposure or bite situation. I will tell you that if they bite a person, by another animal, they will be required to be vaccinated after whatever quarantine period that they have to go to. 
So I get a lot of questions, especially from animal control and shelters, about vaccinating off-label and other species. Um, in some states, they dictate what off-label use can be done. In Indiana, we do not. We leave it up to the discretion of the veterinarian. You can vaccinate wolf hybrids, pet raccoons, pet skunks, a variety of off-label species at the discretion of the veterinarian. Indiana does not recognize that status though. They can be vaccinated, but it doesn't matter. As Dr. Brown pointed out, any wild animal that is that bites a person has no option for a quarantine because there's no recognized quarantine period in these animals that can, that can assure us that they don't have rabies. Just as an example um, of the many rabies meetings I've gone to, somebody exhibited that a skunk actually held the rabies vaccine for up to a couple years. So just so you know that these animals can carry, carry the, the virus without being detectable. So the animal must be sacrificed for testing and this does include wolves and wolf hybrids. Now in the equine and livestock spirit species, there is an approved vaccine it's not required by BOA. We do not require um, livestock to be vaccinated. And we know that since bats are the primary source of rabies in Indiana, farms know there's plenty of opportunity for livestock to be exposed. It's highly recommended if you travel with your animal, especially show animals and things like that, that your livestock be vaccinated. And there are some states, especially the eastern states, that require livestock to be vaccinated because they have a higher incidence of land-based rabies, raccoon strain rabies in particular. Horses are not required by our state to be vaccinated, but the 4-H does require horses to be vaccinated. And there's some private shows that, especially if you go out of state and especially on the East Coast, that will require the horses to be vaccinated in order to enter the show. There's, it's an annual vaccine, by the way, for almost all livestock species. So what is the veterinarian obligated to do? Under the 345 IAC 1-5-1, the veterinarian is required to give written proof of vaccination to the owner, and he's also required to retain that vaccination. And according to the Practice Act for veterinarians, he has to retain that information for three years. And since our vaccines are only good for three years, that's adequate to cover all the vaccines. So he also has to issue a tag to the owner with a unique identification number and the contact information for the veterinarian. And this is done by both rabies clinics and veterinarians. Frequently, clinics will, will release a tag that has the name, sometimes the address, and a phone number, as long as we can contact where the rabies vaccine was given. The rabies vaccine, the tag does not have to be worn. There are some local ordinances that require to, to be worn. That's fine. It's just an external uh, showing of whether the vaccine exists. The most important thing is that vaccine certificate with the date, um, the serial number, the name of the owner, the name of the animal, the identification of the animal, sometimes even the microchip number on it to show that that animal was appropriately vaccinated by that veterinarian. Now, you'll see in the law what will reference a third copy, which may be asked for. It says the state or local authorities may ask for a third copy. We as the state veterinarian do not ask for that third copy. We don't need it. There are some local ordinances where that third copy is collected and used um, to validate vaccination at the local level. That's up to a local ordinance. There's a limited number of government units that do require and collect this third copy. Some of them have a local license, and that's why they collect it. The state doesn't want the third copy. You again can write your local ordinances to ask for that copy and to actually possibly connect to a local license. These records have to be available to local authorities during an investigation. And that also, by the way, is in the Veterinary Practice Act. Um, uh, while records are confidential, they're not proprietary. And in other words, there's no animal HIPAA law, which some people refer to. If there's an investigation going on, if the local health department needs them for private investigation or the animal control does, um, the veterinarian has to give access to both the vaccination records and the, rec and the records that are related to that investigation. So the 10-day quarantine, you must follow, follow the time protocol unless Euthanasia is needed for humane reasons, like Dr. Brown cited before, or the animal cannot be safely quarantined due to aggression. And that kind of requires state approval for. We don't want, uh, we don't want our people arbitrarily um, euthanizing animals and sending heads in. As Dr. Brown cited, we have one person who does rabies testing. We want to test the highest risk animals uh, that may potentially have rabies. So if you have a healthy animal, you really need to complete the 10-day quarantine. Now, we have a lot of people, um, 
allow the um, most local jurisdictions allow it to be done at home. Location is entirely up to you. The Department of Health and the Board of Animal Health will tell you what you need to do and what protocol that you need to follow. But we don't tell you where. It can be at home. You can specify that if it's not vaccinated, um, that it has to be done at a shelter, in a kennel, or in a veterinary office. That's entirely up to local ordinance. And the cost of the quarantine is, respons is the responsibility of the animal owner. Now, we have a question here that if the animal's unvaccinated, does animal control have the authority to take the animal? Uh, no, that's not, that's not necessarily in the state authority. We just tell you that if the animal is unvaccinated, this is what you should do with it. Whether you take it or not has to be contained within your local ordinance. Okay. Now, people ask what the requirements are for a 10-day quarantine. Well, we'd like it to be securely confined. We realize that most of these are done at home and that the family who has had contact with the animal is gonna to continue to, but we would like to prevent elective contact from the general public and actually really from other animals too. We would like that animal to be by itself. Now, a lot of times, and that means that uh, it needs, if it's an outside animal, we would prefer that it be inside a double fence. When we, the Board of Animal Health has done quarantines, for example, for the four month quarantine, we have asked that it be like in a, in a cage or garage inside of a fenced area so that there'd be a double barrier to the animal. Um, if the animal goes outside and it's an inside animal, we actually take it out on a leash so that it doesn't arbitrarily um, uh, escape the yard or run and have contact with other people. Rabies vaccination, if the animal's not vaccinated, is always given after the 10-day quarantine is complete. If there's any illness in the animal, or the, and that needs to be reported to the local health department, and also needs to be taken to a veterinarian to evaluate. And if the animal dies or has to be euthanized during the 10-day quarantine, it has to be decapitated and sent into the laboratory for rabies testing. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about animal-to-animal -animal bites and exposures. They're not a reportable event in this state, but as you local animal control people will understand, and local health department, they frequently raise a number of emotional and liability issues for local officials, such as yourself. BOA handles the situation on a case-by-case -case basis, and the action is, the, the, is guided by the compendium I referred to previously, and we'll give you links to all of these things at the end. And the policy has been adopted um, over the years as we've dealt with these situations. Okay, so we want to talk about what do you do with handling the biter. And uh, we're, if you're talking about a high risk species, Dr. Brown identified that the bite or biting animal, we call them the biter or the biting animal or the bitten or the bitten animal that is involved. And in some cases, this applies to both of them, especially if you have dog bites. High risk species, we remind you this includes bats, skunks, foxes, and sometimes coyotes, any. Um, wild mammal, there is no rabies vaccine approved and there's no recognized quarantine period. These species need to be euthanized and tested for rabies um, in all situations because we have no way to determine if they have rabies without testing and there's no anti-mortem or live test for rabies. It does not matter if the animal has a DNR or a USDA permit. Zoo animals are exception, they make an exception for special uh, species, but they're in a very controlled environment. Um, the whole bat needs to be submitted. Don't try to decapitate the bat. Just send the whole bat in. We're always interested in the species they are, but we just need the head of the other species or the brain needs to be submitted to the lab for testing. Wolf hybrids are included in this group. They are not, um, uh, there's no vaccine or quarantine approved for this species. There's an Indiana code uh, that addresses housing for wolf hybrids and koi dogs. It's IC 1520-1-5. That is in code. And that would be up to local law enforcement to enforce those housing requirements, but that's not, that does not relate um, to rabies handling. So if we're handling the biter and the biter is a dog, cat, or ferret, if their vaccination is current, that means they're currently vaccinated for rabies, they just need to be observed for the 10-day quarantine period. Remember, vaccination status has no uh, effect on the fact that if they bite, they still need to be observed. If they're unvaccinated or there is no proof, we quarantine and observe for 10 days, and then we vaccinate them after the 10-day strict quarantine period. So handling a pet bitten by an unknown or a rabies-positive animal. 
So this is an animal that is, and you're bitten by and the unknown animal can run away. You could not know what it is. It could have been gone. It doesn't matter. Or if the animal tests positive. If your animal is current on rabies vaccination or it's overdue, you want to booster the vaccination within 96 hours. If it's overdue and it's had a, it's had a rabies vaccine at any time, you do the same thing. You vaccinate it within 96 hours of exposure, and then you observe it for 45 Five days. The rabies vaccine creates what we call memory cells, and by boostering it, we can up the titer and, inc and increase the and increase the uh, protection for the dog. If your animal is unvaccinated and it's exposed to an unknown animal, which we would consider rabies suspect because we don't know, or it's, or that it tests positive for rabies, then you vaccinate it within 96 hours of exposure. But the quarantine is four months because it is an unvaccinated animal. Remember, this is an animal who has never had a rabies vaccine or you can't confirm the rabies vaccine. And if you need our help, and frequently health departments or local officials will ask us if we can help and write, and we can write a state quarantine for the four months. The only uh, thing I would understand is that the animal needs to be checked on periodically during this four months. Um, our area veterinarian can come out and write the quarantine and help you with the observation and do some of the checks, but it helps if local officials can um, help us in monitoring the animal during the four month um, observation period. So for handling a pet bitten by a dog, cat, ferret, or livestock, uh, so in other words, animal to animal, the vaccination is current, there's no problem for that bitten animal. We treat the wounds and you really don't need to observe it. It's already currently vaccinated. If it's unvaccinated, you want to vaccinate it at the time of the bite and you want to treat the wounds. Um, <clears throat> this, um, this again needs to uh, be a confined. And remember, these confinements are all at the jurisdiction of local officials. We tell you how to do it and what to do. Where this is done is up to you. Um, there are some local ordinances that direct where these are done and how they're done. Okay, we are commonly asked about animal-animal exposures to high-risk or unknown animals. And I just want to um, identify these three because these are the most common ones we hear. A cat carrying or playing with a bat. And this is commonly in a house where they find a bat. We commonly get questions about why cats need to be vaccinated if in the house, and this is exactly why. Because the mo one of the most common situations we're told is that the cat finds a bat in the house. So they're carrying or playing with the bat. The dog is in a fight with a raccoon, and a raccoon is one of our high-risk species, or a pet that's in a fight with an unknown animal. So in that case, we, of course, would like the animal to be available for testing, especially if it's a wild animal or it's a head on an animal that has died, for example, in a fight. We could submit that animal for testing. It potentially lowers the quarantine period for the animal that is involved in, at the other end of the fight. If it's unavailable, if the animal runs away, we do not have the animal, you throw the bat away, which uh, we frequently hear commonly, you throw the bat away, then we have to treat that as potentially rabid. And then you would follow the procedures for vaccinated or unvaccinated animals with a potentially rabid animal. So as you can see, that can lengthen the quarantine time. So if you get a cat carrying a bat or a dog with a raccoon and you have that other animal, it's very nice to have it available for testing because it will make it more, with, it, with the testing results, we can tell whether the animal is rabid or not rabid. So as a summary, just for this section, and these are, these are points that we commonly like to cover, animal to people bites are reportable. Dr. Brown told you the procedure for that. Animal to animal bites are not, but BOA is always willing to help you handle those animal to animal bites. Local ordinances are very important because while we tell you what to do with animals and people in bite situations, we do not dictate where this is done and how it's done. So it's important that if you want specific guidelines in your county or your municipality, that you have local ordinances that cover those specific details. We'll tell you how to handle them, but if you would like them to be quarantined in the shelter or in a veterinary clinic or in a kennel, or in a specific location, if they're not vaccinated, then you need to specify that in your local ordinances. Quarantine and confinement locations are not dictated again by state rules. Um, it's up to your local agency. Dogs, cats, and ferrets should always be confined and observed for 10 days. We prefer they not be tested, especially if they're healthy and available for quarantining. 
Remember that rabies testing, the testing is done free. That is uh, part of the service to protect the public health is to do testing for high risk animals. But you do have to ship it overnight and do you, you do have, it, it has to be delivered to the laboratory. And remember that it's a good idea if, you, if counties and animal controls develop procedures for getting those samples. Now, veterinarians can help with that, but remember that there's, um, it's actually a cost if we're gonna do this. So it's a good idea to have a relationship with the veterinarian who can help facilitate submission of these samples. And finally, I frequently get asked, who do we determine is at fault? You know, that's not really our job at the state level, and that's really not your job at the local level. You're, you're trying to protect the public health from rabies and determine the status of the animal. But fault is something that really is involved between the two owners of the animal, the person bitten and the owner, and that's really a civil procedure. And so if they want to determine fault, that's something they have to work on themselves. The only thing I can tell you is it's frequently going to be involved in a legal um, uh, procedure. And if it does, they're going to want like the bite reports, they're going to want your investigative reports, they're going to want vaccination records. So just remember, it's not up to either the state or the local officials to determine who's at fault in these situations, but it's really up to you to investigate and produce the proper documents involved um, in those situations. So now we're done uh, so far and, uh, with, the, with, that, with the vaccination and quarantine laws and health situations. Dr. Melissa Justice now is going to address different scenarios and situations that you might come across and how we would handle them. Okay, so I just wanna wrap things up by talking about some scenarios and situations that we frequently get asked um, at both the health department, the state health department and the Board of Animal Health. We understand that when someone is bitten or a human is exposed, there's a high level of anxiety and you at the local agencies make it some pressure to make a quick decision um, as to whether that animal needs to be euthanized, as to whether um, the human needs to get post-exposure vaccinations and things like that. So what we kind of wanted to talk about is, is when is a situation truly an emergency that you need to, to act immediately? Um, and so some high priority situations where you may want to um, contact our agencies for assistance, or you may want to make decisions sooner rather than later would include a human that's been bitten on or close to the head, or a human that's been bitten by a high risk species. So foxes, skunk, bats, raccoons, coyotes, things like that. Non-emergency situations where you have a little bit of luxury of time to make decisions. You could certainly um, wait until the next business day if it's after normal business hours and contact one of our agencies to get advice on how to handle your situation. Those would be animal to animal bites or exposures or human bites when all of the parties are known and the animal has been retained so that you could start the quarantine period immediately while decisions are made. One of the things that, that we get questions on quite frequently is, um, where are my test results? And so I think it's important for people to understand that um, if you submit your testing or your samples on a paper copy, you will not necessarily be notified of negative test results. If you submit those um, via LensNet, all of those negative results and positive results are posted as soon as they're processed in the LensNet system. So you'll have access to those. If you're using the paper copies, you will not be notified of a, of a negative test result. You can rest assured that if there's a positive result, um, those are gonna be reported immediately by phone to the, the submitter, whether it's a veterinarian, a local health department, or an animal control agency, um, as well as, as someone will be making contact with the exposed person to talk to them about the next steps. Um, specimens that are received by 11 a.m. at the laboratory will be tested that same business day. So you have the option, you can either um, mail those or, or submit those via, via overnight career, or you also have the option, um, if, you, if you want test results sooner rather than later, that you can deliver those directly to the, la the laboratory during normal business hours. If you have any questions, feel free to, to call the State Health Department um, at 317-233-7125. Another question that we get is, um, what happens if an animal dies and it's exposed to human during that time frame, 
and the owner wants to know the cause of death. It's important for you to realize that the testing that's done at the state health department only determines the rabies status of that animal. It will not tell you the cause of death if that animal has died. Um, and so in that situation, that animal can be submitted um, as the whole animal to the Animal Disease Diagnostic Laboratory at Purdue for a necropsy. There is a fee associated with the necropsy, but they can help determine the cause of death in that situation. What you need to do is you need to make it clear on the accession form when you submit that animal that the animal has bitten someone and that a rabies sample needs to be submitted to the health department. And the um, diagnosticians at the Purdue Laboratory will collect that sample for you and submit it on your behalf to the rabies laboratory so that you can also determine the rabies status of the animal as well as the cause of death. So what happens if you're not sure if an animal should be tested or not? It's not during normal business hours. Um, it seems like these things always happen you know, in the evening or on a night or weekend. You can refrigerate that animal and then contact either the Board of Animal Health or the state health department on the next business day, and we can help you make a determination as to whether that sample should be submitted. Um, when in doubt, retain the animal, and or if it's alive, go ahead and initiate a quarantine period until you can contact us. We get a question a lot of what happens if the owner um, refuses to allow the testing of the animal. Um, you know, for whatever reason, the animal's been euthanized or it's deceased, and, and they don't want to think about um, you having to submit those tissues. That can be pretty unsavory for an owner to think about. So what we suggest you do in this situation is just go ahead and keep control of that animal, refrigerate the body until the next business day, and then contact the local health department. They can contact the owner and explain why it's important to determine the rabies status of that animal. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, there's no live animal test. There's no test to determine the rabies status without submitting tissues to the laboratory. Um, so because a human may be at risk, we really need to, to submit those samples. So I want to close out today by just talking about four common situations that you may be fight, facing um, and kind of tell you how we would recommend that you address the situation. To start off with would be two low-risk species. Um, either two dogs or two cats in a fight, and the owner is bitten. And, and this happens very, very commonly. The owner tries to intervene and they get bitten in the process. The bitten person needs to be referred for medical attention. A bite report needs to be filed with the local health department. You need to determine the rabies vaccination status of both ab animals and observe a 10-day quarantine period for the biter. Uh, and as we mentioned earlier, the location of the observation period or the quarantine period can be determined locally. This can happen in a, in a, you know, in the home, it can happen at a veterinary clinic, or it can happen at the animal control agency. The situation number two is where there are two dogs or two cats in a fight and there's no human exposure. In that situation, you determine the vaccination status of both animals. You would administer a booster vaccine to either animal if necessary. Um, determine whether a confinement or quarantine period needs to be observed. And you can always contact BOA if, um, if you need additional guidance or if you have a you know, strange caveat to the situation or whatnot. But not all of these animals have to necessarily be strictly quarantined if there's no human exposure. Case number three is a situation where you have a dog, cat, or a ferret that's gotten into a fight with a wild animal. And what, what, uh, important is what the wild is, we know that it's a rabies vector species, so a uh, skunk, a raccoon, a fox, a coyote, or a bat, you would want to euthanize the wild animal if it's available, submit that animal for testing, and then vaccinate Vaccinate the dog, cat, or ferret within 96 hours of exposure, and confine or quarantine is determined by the vaccination status of that animal. It also is determined by the rabies status of the animal that's submitted. If it's the dog, cat, or ferret has been attacked or gotten into a fight with other species, such as a squirrel, a possum, or a rodent, you do not have to test those species because they're considered to be non-susceptible. Um, and if the dog, cat, or ferret is not vaccinated, you want to go ahead and, and vaccinate within 96 hours of the um, exposure. 
if the boost, if the animal is currently vaccinated, you may decide to go ahead and, and administer another vaccine and we'll let the veterinarian who's caring for that animal make that determination. The last situation is when there you have a bite by an unowned or an unknown animal that's not available for testing. If this is a person, you want to get medical attention and report the bite. If it's an animal, as we said earlier, if the dog has dog, cat, or ferret is unvaccinated, has never received a vaccine in its life, you want to vaccinate that animal within 96 hours and quarantine for a period of four months. If the animal is vaccinated currently or is overdue but has received a vaccine at some point in its life, you want to vaccinate that animal within 96 hours and you want to observe for 45 days. The last thing that I want to talk about um, before we close things out is um, wolf hybrids. We get a, a lot of questions about wolf hybrids um, and how to handle those. And as um, Dr. Norman stated earlier, the only thing that we actually have written in Indiana code is the requirements for how those animals are to be housed. If you have have wolf hybrids in your area or if you you know feel that you may someday be facing a situation where a wolf hybrid or a wolf has bitten someone you want to go ahead and you want to start thinking about how to develop local ordinances or local regulations before you get yourself into that situation um, as we stated previously those animals um, aren't considered to be um, a vaccinatable species or they're not considered to be a quarantinable species but this is something that you really need to address locally before you get into that situation so that you have ordinances on your books um, so that you can determine how those situations are going to be handled. So some of the resources that we have available um, are the, the rabies slide card and we're in the process of updating this um, to reflect the new quarantine period so there'll be more to come on that. We also have resources available on the BOA website under the rabies heading. For human exposures, um, you can contact local health departments or the Indiana State Department of Health. And for any animal exposure, you can contact our agency. With that, we'll open the floor to questions. All right. Thank you for um, participation. If anybody has any questions, please feel free to use the uh, chat feature. Um, we do have a question here. There was recently a dog bite on a friend of mine and they were seen at a local ready med and I have yet to have received anything in MPS. That's because they did not report it correctly. Thanks for that question. This is Jen Brown. Um, so there's a couple of different possible explanations for that situation. Um, healthcare providers are actually required by state law to report animal bites when, um, when they when they see patients who have been bitten by animals in their practices. And so um, if, if you are aware of a bite um, that hasn't, uh, and, a, and a person did receive medical attention, but you haven't, that hasn't come through your, your NBS queue yet, um, a few possible explanations. So one may be that um, they faxed it to you and the fax went astray. Uh, one may be that it, they faxed it to us and um, it has not been entered yet. We try to get those entered into NBS as quickly as we can, but there is obviously a, a delay associated with that data entry. Um, one is that maybe it's been faxed to us and has been, um, has been entered, but hasn't been assigned to you yet, which I can actually say is not the case because I was just at NBS this morning and cleared out everything that was awaiting assignment. So there, there shouldn't be a delay um, on that end. Um, and then the other possible explanation is that that it wasn't reported. So um, if this is a facility in your jurisdiction, um, it's a great idea to reach out to them and um, remind them of the reporting requirement, tell them it's come to your attention of at least one bite um, that, uh, that occurred that was seen at their facility that you haven't had the chance to have a look at yet in your system, and then you know, talk to them about ways to improve their reporting processes. Okay. Um, question about squirrel bites a human. Is rabies testing required? Um, no, actually, that's a situation. A squirrel is one of those um, species that we would consider to be low risk for rabies transmission. Squirrels uh, are mammals, so they're they're physiologically capable of getting a rabies infection. But um, in reality, um, 
small prey animals like squirrels and other small rodents don't, if they're attacked by a rabid animal, they don't tend to live long enough to then be capable of transmitting the disease to other animals or to people. So um, almost always, I would consider that a low, such a low risk situation that I would not recommend or even authorize uh, rabies testing of that animal at our lab because it's not a good use of taxpayer resources to test an animal for rabies if we really don't think that it, that it has rabies. That being said, um, if that squirrel was um, neurologic, possibly neurologic, or if it was um, behaving in an abnormal or bizarre way at the time that the bite occurred, I would authorize testing in that unusual situation. So if you have an unusual squirrel situation, call me. But 99% um, of these are, um, you know, a kid went out in the yard and was trying to feed a squirrel or, um, or it was a, a bite that was provoked in some other way. And so those are so low risk that we wouldn't recommend testing. Um, here's another one. Um, a woman traveling in Thailand was bitten by a stray cat. She received the rabies vaccine in Thailand on day zero and a second vaccine on day three. I helped the client with the idea to finish the series. Is this reportable or what do I do? Um, I would, you know, so obviously Thailand is not, the Thailand healthcare provider is not going to report to us. Um, I would encourage you um, to report that because um, in addition to animal bites being reportable, the administration of rabies prophylaxis is also reportable in our state regs. And um, so by, by entering that situation into NBS, you'll be meeting that reporting requirement. And I, I would argue you're also, um, I, th I think in a situation like that, uh, where, where a person's received a high risk exposure and, um, and Profi has been administered, and especially if, um, you know, if, if there's going to be some deviations from the protocol, I think it would be a really prudent action um, on the part of local health departments to enter that in NBS so that all of your actions and recommendations associated with that patient can be documented um, in that system. So I, I would definitely encourage you to, to enter that one in NBS. Here's what I think for Dr. Norman. If we have a dog that is not, not safe to handle at the shelter for the quarantine period, do we as the shelter still have the authority to euthanize and ship for testing? During our peak season, we cannot have dogs in full runs due to space constraints. Um, it is, if we have an animal that is not handleable during the quarantine period, and I do have shelters and veterinarians to call and say, this is a very high risk animal for my staff to handle. Um, they're being very aggressive and very vicious. We will sometimes, you know, we, we understand that it can be, and then if it's within the 10 day period, that'll need to be euthanized and checked for rabies. Um, we don't want you, if you can at least hang on to the animal for 10 days uh, to euthanize it. It's, um, if it's handleable and you can feed and water it for 10 days, if the animal is healthy and normal, we'd rather do it that way. But we do understand in very aggressive cases or in cases where um, it just is not um, feasible for you to keep the dog because it's a danger um, to your employees, yourself, and the general public, we understand that those animals can be euthanized, but they do need to be checked rabies if they get the person within 10 days. One thing I'll interject on that too is that um, in that situation, you would need the owner's permission to euthanize. The Indiana Code doesn't necessarily um, give you the authority to make that decision without the owner's um, you know, express permission. You would have to have a local ordinance in place that would say that, that you have that authority uh, to make that decision against the owner's wishes. Um, so that's another thing that you, know, you may wanna think about locally um, if you have an aggressive dog and the owner won't grant you permission to euthanize, you may want to put something in place to allow you to do that. Yeah. Aggressive dog ordinances sometimes cover these things in certain, in certain areas. Um, let's see. Next question that we have is, I often receive bite reports from medical providers and learn that the person bitten never contacted the authorities. In regard to the quarantine piece, do we as a health department go over with that that client, or is it best to refer it to the authorities? So who's obligated there? I can take that one. So um, this is Jen Brown. Um, that's a great question. Um, that's a situation where, um, in any situations in general, I think um, if we're aware of information that's actionable from a public health 
standpoint, I think it's best to um, take the burden of responsibility off of the, the patient or the exposed person. So, um, so in that situation where a healthcare provider has reported a bite, um, but you contact the patient and learn that, um, that they have not contacted animal control, um, my preference in that situation or my recommendation um, would be to encourage you to um, make a report to animal control on that person's behalf. Um, I know capacity varies and you know all, all of all of these things take time um, and that you have a lot of other things going on in your agencies but my worry is that um, people can be hesitant to talk to animal control about these things for various reasons like if it was their neighbor's dog that bit them for example they don't want to um, call animal control and um, you know and then have a problem with their neighbor or maybe it's a family member's dog so, um, so I think that sometimes if you put the onus for reporting um, or contacting animal control on the patient, then that may result in the reporting not happening. And if it is their own health that may be at risk, but that doesn't, that's not always completely understood by people in these situations. So um, the best practice in that situation would be to contact the appropriate animal control agency and make a report on behalf of the patient and then maybe give the patient a heads up that you're going to do that and then they can tell their neighbor hey i wasn't going to call them the health department did it i you know it's not my not my fault that um that, that animal control uh, you know is now knocking on your door so that would be my suggestion in that case okay and, um, the question came up again we were kind of discussing that here is there a written procedure or guidance on decapitation for testing dr Mullen? Well, there's no, there's probably no written procedure. I, I always think it's encouraging if health departments animal control have a relationship with the veterinarian because we're taught how to decapitate animals uh, appropriately. And, um, and I know some animal controls do it, but they've also been guided by veterinarians. So I would encourage you to have a relationship with the veterinarian who can help you with, help you with that procedure. Um, that it's not, um, um, it's not difficult, but if you do it correctly, it's um, also a little more efficient. So I would work with the veterinarian on uh, finding out how to decapitate animals, especially if the animal control would like to do it, I would work with them. Um, I, I just spoke, this is Jen Brown. I spoke with one of my counterparts in another state who has prepared some training materials on that topic, okay. but um, it, it's not clear yet if those will be be made publicly available or available okay. to other states because there's just been a bit of sensitivity around mm -hmm. around that topic. But um, if you know, if they are able to share those materials, um, we'll make sure that those are accessible to all of you who might be able to benefit from them. Okay. Here's a fun one. Um, Dr. Brown for reporting. <laughs> the animal control and law enforcement agencies in my county can collect the paper reports for months, then drop them off to me in a stack of 100 plus bites. They've been talking about this, but still don't get them to me in a timely manner. The bite reports are filled out by officers, but not given to me to enter into MBS, sometimes for six plus months after the bite. Any suggestions to get them to get reports to me sooner? My supervisor said she discussed it with them multiple times, and I'm new to the position a couple weeks ago and received two huge stacks dating back to September 2018. Okay, so my first response to that would be, you know, number one, I'm so sorry. I do sympathize. I worked at a local, um, Health Department in Colorado. It was three counties, and I think we had 17 or maybe 19 animal control agencies that we worked with. And um, you know, we had a different relationship with with each one of those agencies. And I I definitely have been there, and I do sympathize with um, with this situation. And there's not an easy solution, right? It sounds like it sounds like you have reached out, and um, and nothing much has changed. I'll tell you that one thing that worked for us. Um, in that in that situation I was in at the local level out in Colorado was um, we would um, no less than annually we would have a face to face meeting with animal control officers and we would order pizza and um, you know maybe give a little presentation and um, just do some um, face to face time um, to to try to um, uh, just get a little bit more buy-in um, that, you know, we're not trying to hassle you. We're not trying to tell you how to do your job. The, the reason we need this information is actually uh, because it benefits the residents of our, our jurisdiction that both of our agencies serve. And um, just try to um, try to use some, some FaceTime to develop a little bit more of a cooperative spirit. And um, 
that might be more successful than you know having supervisors call supervisors or, or send emails. So um, that would be one suggestion. Um, and with you being new, you, know, you have a perfect excuse to set up something like that. You can say, hey, I don't know any of you all out there very well yet. Let's have a meeting to get together and we can talk about what I need to do to do my job. You can tell me about the challenges you're facing in your job and maybe we can troubleshoot together or problem solve together. Um, I know that's easier said than done. Trust me, I, I have been there, but um, that's I think that a lot of these um, these situations are best attacked by a face-to-face -face meeting um, to start with. Yeah, and I would say one of the things that Dr. Brown did in the very first slide was to thank you um, for helping us with rabies control. Remember, in the United States, if we have one or two people die of rabies a year, that's a lot. Mm -hmm. There are 30,000 people they, worldwide, mostly in underdeveloped countries that are exposed to and die of rabies. So remember that what you do and animal control officers do and veterinarians do is very important to keeping rabies a scarce occurrence in the United States of America, and we need to keep it that way. So um, please, when you have that meeting, thank them for their work. Um, thank them for what they've done to keep rabies a rare disease in the United States of America. Of course, now that we've had this joint session with ACOs and local health departments, we're good, right? So we're, yeah. we're all in a cooperative spirit right now. So yeah. Everybody knows why it's important, and we'll move forward from here, right? Yeah, hopefully your partner agency is listening, but uh, if not, you know, maybe you can send us a link. Yeah, hopefully and I, will, yeah. and I would contribute, Dr. Justice, we do have area veterinarians, and they work with the animal controls and the law enforcement agencies, I think. We would all be happy, you know, if, if there's something, we have district veterinarians, and Dr. Justice can talk to this, I think, probably more appropriately than I can about the relationship and how you can help build that, and maybe you can help in that way. Sure. We, um, as, as our field veterinary staff, we try to um, reach out to the, the agencies in our area um, at least once a year, um, just so that people have a name to associate with with our faces and they know who that they can call in a situation. And so I, I think as Dr. Brown was stating earlier, just by reaching out and personally talking to someone makes it easier for them to reach out to you in return if they need something on your behalf. Um, and I think it just opens lines of communication so that people people will feel comfortable um, giving you a call in a in a situation like this. So I would encourage you to to you know just consider just stopping by their agency at some point to give them your contact information <laughs> so that the communication lines can be. All right, great. Well, it looks like we covered all the questions. Um, and if you have any other questions, our contact information is on the screen right now. And feel free to reach out to us. We're here to help whatever we can. And um, thanks for taking time today and participating.